Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah wa kafa. Wa salatu wa salam ala habib Mustafa wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa ala man ittabal huda amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Respected brothers, sisters, elders, ulama ikram, mufti sayf al-islam sahab. First of all, jazakumullah khair for giving me this opportunity to deliver this uh, topic on such an auspicious uh, occasion. Usually, when, when you see talks, when you hear talks and bayans, it's not custom that you see PowerPoint presentations. But since the time, but since the time that I have started been delivering uh, PowerPoint presentation slides, I've realized that people tend to be, be more engaged, especially if it's visual, visual learning. So I've realized that through visual learning, people are more engaged. And especially if it's the, um, with the sisters and the children, because it helps you to stay focused because you're seeing something. Now I just wanted to mention that um, this slide that I'm presenting to you is actually a snippet of one of my detailed workshops that I delivered on depression. I was invited in Scotland during, the, uh, during the, these Christmas holidays and I delivered a course, an intensive workshop, sorry not course, an intensive workshop on anxiety and depression. How do we deal with depression? Using the Quranic and prophetic instructions. So this is just like a snippet of that, but I've just retitled it by saying dealing with internal struggle. Now why have I titled it as this? Is because every single one of us, brothers or sisters, as human beings, we deal with struggle from within. And these struggle, they manifest from, manifest through different, different ways. The influences that Muslims have, or the things that influence a Muslim's ma mind and a Muslim's heart, it could be many reasons, whether it be due to the environment, whether it be through social or personal circumstances, sometimes it may be because of financial constraint. So there are many, many reasons. So every one of us are battling with this internal struggle. Sometimes we have certain doubts in Islam. We doubt certain things in Islam. There are certain things in Islam that certain aspects or certain teachings of Islam that we find it difficult to grapple, find it difficult to come to terms with. Or sometimes a person has gone through so much struggle, so much, so much hard time in life, gone through so much difficulty, it comes to a point that where you feel that you're reaching to a dead end. There's no, there's no way out for you. So how do you deal with those internal struggles? Now there are many different facets to this. There are many, many different angles to this. I'm going to focus on one specific area. And that is talking about human nature. How Allah has created, uh, created the human being. And the different elements that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes human beings in the Quran. And how do those manifest through our actions and how do we control them? What's the solution? So this is going to be, this is the summary of the course of my topic. So now, let's first begin. I'm going to begin by this Quranic verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, and this is Surah Al-Ma'arij. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ خُلِقَ هَلُوعًا إِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ جَزُوعًا وَإِذَا مَسَّهُ الْخَيْرُ مَنُوعًا إِلَّا الْمُصَلِّينَ now I'm going to come back to this verse, so what I want you all to do is just remember this verse. I know most of the people are not half it here, but if you can at least remember the, remember the content of this, I am going to come back to this afterwards. Now what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala state? Verily mankind has been created anxious. So if you notice the words that I've underlined, that's the closest translation. Now just to be clear, is that Arabic, the classical Arabic or the Quranic Arabic, it's so versatile and it's so unique that English translations cannot do full justice to it. So a person can never attempt to understand the Quran just by reading translations. Because Arabic and English, they're complete different worlds apart. Translations are there just to give us a guide or just give us an understanding. But a person can never truly grasp at the Quranic Arabic just by mere English translation. Anyways. So, look at this verse. 
Indal insan khuliqa halu'a. Verily, mankind has been created anxious. Anxious. When difficulty afflicts him, he panics. In the Ida Masahu Shar Jazu'a. The when calamity, when difficulty, when hardship afflicts him, he he begins to panic. And when and when he experiences good fortune, he becomes miserly. Manu'a from the word manu'a. Now, just want to get slightly technical here, is that you look at the terms halu and jazur, it comes on the Arabic scale of fa'ul. Now, those of you who are studying Arabic, or those who you inshallah will be, just to give you a bit of a, uh, a taster, that there are certain Arabic scales that convey certain meaning. That if a noun or a verb, if they were to fall onto those patterns of scale, it conveys a specific meaning. Now, let's say for the word halu'a. Halu'a is from the word hala'a, which means to be worried, to be grief, to have grief. But when it comes on the scale of fa'ul, like it's here, like halu'a. It's all right. It's on the scale of, on the scale of falu, uh, um, fa'ul, it means a person is anxious all the time. Anxious all the time, worried all the time. That when calamity befalls him, they start panicking. They go into panic mode. They start overthinking. Right? Anybody deny this? We've all had this panic mode, right? Anything that's happened to you, or for example, you lost your job, or there's been a death in the family, or you failed your exams, you failed your A-levels, you failed your GCSEs, you failed your degree, or you failed your driving test, you had such a great attachment to something, but yet your needs and your desires and your aspirations were not fulfilled. Something happened that where there's been a big turn in your life, you start panicking. We start panicking. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions when evil bef befalls a person, he starts, he starts to panic. Fortune, except those who perform prayer, we're going to come to that point later on. So now, there's a great scholar by the, the name of Qani Thana'ullah, Qani Pati Rahmatullahi Alayhi. When he explains this verse, what does he say? It means that when a calamity befalls a man, he is struck with fear. And as a result, he panics and despairs from any fortune, for future goodness, except those who possess the necessary attributes through which Allah Ta'ala safeguards them. This is in Tafsir al-Mazhari. So in short, what he's trying to say, the Mufassir, Rahimahullah, he's saying that, you know, when calamity befalls a human being and he's struck with fear, he begins to overthink. When he begins to overthink, he begins to lose hope, which is why that is important that whenever you're going through this kind of calamity or going through this kind of phase in life, it's always good to talk to somebody. Because what happens, your vision becomes narrow. Your vision becomes narrow. You begin to overlook, it's naturally you begin to overlook the good blessings. And sometimes you overlook the you begin to overlook the fact that everything that happens is through the will of Allah and everything what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does, He does this out of His sheer mercy and out of His infinite wisdom and knowledge. We tend to forget that. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of planners. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all wise. But yet at times when we have aspirations, when we have a, a dream of something, we expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill that dream for us. And as a result, we think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do everything according to our wishes. But Allah ta'ala doesn't work like that. Now, what I've done here is throughout the Quran, throughout the Quran, those terms that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses to describe the human weaknesses, this, this is on the summary. So the innate human weaknesses and emotions. Now, before I begin, before I mention, before I bring those slides up, a couple of things I want to mention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions all of this is to indicate one thing. Is to indicate one important thing. And that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acknowledges human emotions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acknowledges human weaknesses. When somebody comes to you, seeking advice and they go through problems we should never ever dismiss them you know why it's because human weaknesses is something that is 
part and parcel of human nature. You know these anxieties and worries that we have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them in the Quran is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acknowledges that we as human beings were a weak creation. We're not an infallible creation. We're not a creation that we're, we're only ha we're, that we're perfect. Rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that he has, that Allah ta'ala knows that we have weaknesses because Allah ta'ala is the one who created us like that. He created us like that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents so many examples of the prophets. Like for example, Prophet Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. He went through, he went through a struggle in his life when he lost his son Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam. And the list goes on and on and on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is one of the things that we tend to overlook. And this is an important point here is that when we study the lives of the Prophet we talk, we, dis, we look at the prophetic life, we view and read the prophetic life, not just the Prophet ﷺ, but all of the Prophets, just as historical. But how many of us actually study the lives of the Prophet ﷺ in terms of the emotional struggles that they went through? Because if there's anything that we can gain, if there's anything that we can attain from the Prophet's lives, not just the Prophet ﷺ, but all of the Prophets wasalam, if there's anything we can attain from them, is their human nature. They, as a result, they had, they went through emotional struggles. So emotional struggles is something that is part and parcel of human nature. Now, Allah Ta'ala mentions the word jazu, constraint heart. Next is halu. Halu means um, miserly, impatient and hasty. What, what we call, for example, in, uh, what we refer to, for example, is Jalbazi. Jalbazi. You know, there's a person very hasty. We become hasty at times. You see a nice car. You're looking for a nice car, for example. You're looking for a nice computer. Looking for a nice house. You see, mashallah, is everything. I've got the money, right? I want to buy it. But then you think, hold on a second. Let's inspect it first. There's no one inspecting, right? But we, as human nature, we think, you know, it's so nice. It's very attractive. It's, um, I mean, you get the message, right? So we're very hasty. Allah Ta'ala says that. Next, huzn. We have grief, we have sorrow. Sorrow of the past. Now the word huzn in Arabic actually means to be grievous of the past. There's some kind of loss that you had in life. And as a result of that, the grief that struck you in Arabic, that's called huzn. That's called huzn. Something's happened to you in the past. You failed your exam, for example. You failed your driving test. Something's happened to you. And now you are grievous over that. Somebody's passed away. That is called huzn in Arabic. Khawf. What happens when you become, when you become uh, grievous? When you're grieved about something? When you've lost something? Don't we panic? Don't we overthink? Yes or no? That's what khawf means. Khawf means fear. And the word khashya also is used. Fearing. Fearing of the future. Likewise, the word bath. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the term bath for Sayyidina Yaqub alayhi salam. And what is that? Intolerable grief due to a severe calamity. Which means that where the, you're overwhelmed with so much grief, so much sadness, and so much pressure, it comes to a breaking point in your life that way you can no longer bear it inside. Yes or no? Human beings, right? There's something that's happened to you, you and me, something that's happened to you. Now we need to reflect on this. Something that's happened to you or you know somebody that they've gone through so much problems, so much problems, so much problems in their life. You think, you know what? I cannot tolerate it anymore. You start beginning to question. You start questioning. Why Allah Ta'ala is doing this? Why is Allah doing that? This is not fair. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing this to me for? I've not done anything wrong. That leads to what? Jadal. Jadal means disputatious. We're not going to accept the reality. Human beings were disputatious. We dispute a lot. So you see here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining to us one thing. Two things. Number one, that Allah ta'ala acknowledges that we have human emotions. And number two, for us to reflect the fact that we have weaknesses, we need guidance. We need guidance. 
a person is a foolish. A foolish person is the one who feels that, who thinks that he's independent so much that he doesn't need anybody else's advice and help. He's the foolish person. Do you know why? It's because not only will he not appreciate, not realize that he's got weaknesses, but, he's not, he, but he will not set out to do anything about it. And in terms of what happens, a person becomes worse and worse and worse and worse. Now, look at this slide here. Because this is um, a, a, spir a spiritual gathering, you look at human emotions, if you look at beliefs, and you've got behavior. All this boils down to one thing, Islamic spirituality. What is Islamic spirituality? When you talk about the sawwuf, when you talk about tazkiyatul nafs, right? When you talk about tazkiyatul nafs, right? It's about not just connecting yourself with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although that's the primary goal. But we're unable to control our emotions, know the fact that everything's from Allah, to maintain our belief and mindset, and I'm going to talk about this and to control our behavior. Islamic spirituality is not just about zikr of Allah. Many times that when you talk to people, you know, if I, before this slide, if I ever did a survey that what does tazkiyah mean, what does, what does uh, spirituality mean? Majority of the people, 90% of the time they say it means salah, it means zikr, okay? Say in a gathering doing zikr, reading Quran, Alhamdulillah that is part and parcel of it. But what's the objective behind this? Objective the primary objective, the primary goal is, of course, to gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what impact does this have when you gain closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You are able to control your emotions. You are able to contain yourself. You've gone through some kind of internal struggle. This struggle that you're battling from inside, from within, you're able to control that. You're able to subdue that one way or another. You're also able to maintain uh, your belief your thought process, everything that you do right now today, any decision that you make or any action that you do, there is a thought process. There is a thought process. You do something because of a belief that you have. Why have you all come here for? Why have you all come here for? Mm -hmm. Why have you all come here? Mm -hmm. Be belief, okay. You can, go to, uh, you can go to another Islamic lecture. It's not about me, okay. It's about you, it's about you all. Why are we all here? Because of what? Getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and knowing the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our Lord and if we have a duty to Him, that's brought us here. And just imagine if a person who doesn't believe in Allah ta'ala, is he going to benefit from the gathering? No, he won't. So that's a behavior. If God forbid, if God forbid, you're, you're alone in the masjid and somebody dropped a 50 pound note here. There's no cameras, nobody's watching. You think, you know, I'll just take it and just put it in my pocket. Would you do that? Why won't you? Why won't you? I'm asking the question, why not? Yeah. Allah's watching. It's your belief. It's your belief, isn't it? It's your consciousness, the fact that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching and you, are, you will be held accountable to this, even if you get away with it, nobody's going to watch you. Nobody, nobody's going to catch you. There's no cameras or nothing. You can just take it. Take the 50 pounds, take it home, put it in your safe, and as if nothing happened. And nobody will detect you. Nobody will. It's because of your consciousness that's prevented you from taking that 50 pound note. Now, human being, now this is one of my favorite slides. Now, let's talk a bit about the human being. We talked about Islamic spirituality is about controlling your emotions, your belief and your behavior. Now, one of the things is that when somebody is going through some kind of internal struggle, we're struggling with certain things, we're going through grief, we're going through problems in life, what do people tend to do? When you go to specific counselors, I'm not saying all counselors are bad, you know, there are mashallah a lot of benefits in this, but when somebody goes to counseling, what do they do? There is a specific therapy Okay, called the CBT, the Cognitive Behaviour Therapy. You've gone through a problem, you've gone through so much distress, a calamity struck you, you go to a counsellor. And what does this counsellor do? He uses a therapy called CBT, which means the Cognitive Behaviour Therapy. What's that? That basically what it is, it's they try to engage in your thoughts. Engage in your thoughts. 
There's another remedy, for example, is that where you try to calm yourself down. Relaxing therapy, relaxation. What is that? For some people they say, I listen to music. Listen to music is kind of relaxing. Some say, okay, go out and watch a movie is kind of relaxing. Or some say that go and, for example, go have a drink and that will be relaxing. Now, even though these things may be relaxing for a person, but what is the fundamental problem? Apart from the fact that they are haram. You see, as a point of principle, we have to remember, when human beings go through problems, when human beings experience internal struggle, it's the ruh of the human being that struggles. It's the ruh itself, it's the spiritual soul itself that is struggling. It's the spiritual soul itself that's calling out for help. It's the spiritual ruh itself that feels the pain and the distress and the pressure. Right? Now, if you look at this slide here, the nafs is the human being. The nafs is the human being. Inside the human being, we have the ruh, the soul. And the ruh has a qalb, which is called the heart. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the heart, the qalb is referring to the heart that resides in the ruh itself. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created his physical body, right? Where does the ruh come from? Where does the ruh come from? Where does the ruh come from? Ji? The chest. Subhanallah. Where does the ruh come from? Anybody? Yes, yeah, soul. Where does the soul come from? Do, do we all believe you have a soul? Is there anybody that denies the soul? We all have a soul, right? Where does the soul come from? It comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that once the, once the fetus inside, once the fetus, it reaches to 120 days, uh, 120 days mark, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends an angel and blows the ruh of life inside the fetus. Now it becomes a living thing, now it becomes a living human being. So how do you define human being when they have a ruh inside? When a person doesn't have a ruh, he's lifeless. So the ruh that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is the ruh itself that feels the pain. Therefore, we have to nourish the ruh. Just as the human being, okay, you need to nourish the body. You have to nourish the body by exercising regularly. Exercising regularly. You have to have the right food and the right diet. Okay, and if you're and if you're ill, then you have to give it the right, right kind of medication. So just as when a person is physically ill, and your body is crying out for help, and you have to treat it, likewise the ruh itself, when it's going through internal struggle, internal battle, internal struggle, is crying out for help. Which means that you need to nourish it, and we can only nourish it with that what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us to do. That's why when a person goes and listens to music or goes and watches a movie for example or takes drugs for example and thinking that this is a kind of relaxation for them it still does not solve the problem why is because the root itself that's come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is crying out for help you're use you're taking the wrong direction you are going to the wrong path in trying to in trying to cure and trying to eliminate the problem whereas the root itself is carrying is crying out for something else it's like you're trying to nourish your body for something which is not being made for if you try to have raw meat, it's poisonous for you, yes? But you try to, uh, treat, you try to, treat, uh, you try to feed a lion or a tiger um, cooked meat, it's dangerous for it. Or you try to feed it uh, grass or try to feed a vegetable, it's, uh, it's going to struggle. Try to feed a cow meat, it's going to struggle because their they, they digestive system has not been designed to, uh, to digest those types of food. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the ruh itself, Allah ta'ala has given a specific types of nourishments. Specific types of nourishment. Now, and for that is, for the ruh itself, it needs settlement. That settlement is the heart, the qalb. Now, this is an, again one of my favorite slides. This now talks about the condition and the states of the heart. Now, we talked about the ruh. We talked about the importance of the ruh. But inside the root that is the heart, the qalb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whenever, whenever he talks about the heart, whenever he talks about the heart, he's not talking about the physical heart. He's talking about what? He's talking about the heart of the soul. The heart of the soul. The root itself has a heart. And whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the disbelievers, that where their hearts have been sealed, or when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that their heart do not comprehend, do not understand, is talking about the heart of the root and the soul. And by the way, just to mention something else to you. We always taught that the heart is a place of the emotions 
and the mind itself is a place is the place of rationality is the place of thinking is a place of intel, uh, intelligence and intellectuals that's not the case in islam the heart itself is not just the seat and the place of emotions it's also the place of knowledge it's also the place of wisdom there's a hadith on the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam i'll just mention a few examples i think i know everybody's getting bored now so do bear with me one example is where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said man zahida fi dunya askan allahu qalbahu li hikma the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that whosoever disassociates separates and disconnects from the luxuries of this dunya whosoever disconnects from the luxuries of dunya in other words he's not interested in the luxuries of this dunya that's what you call a zahid a person that who's ascetic who's got no inclination to the luxuries of this dunya what did the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say askan allahu qalbahu al hikmah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will settle wisdom in his heart he did not say settle wisdom in the brain he did not say settle wisdom in the mind he said settle wisdom in the heart and what did the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say after that he said through that you were able to solve the problems of the dunya you'll be able to see things through different light you'll be able to see the reality of the dunya and not only that through that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take a person um, allah ta'ala will take the person from this world to the hereafter in jannah so three states of uh, three states of the heart now ibn qayyim al-jawziyyah rahimahullah who's one of the great scholars uh, uh, one of the great scholars of this ummah he divides the category he divides the heart of the entire human beings okay now put yourself in the shoes which category do you for do we fall in of terms of our heart so there are three types of hearts the first one is the dead heart the first is the dead heart or what's the sign of that it's lifeless pursuits of desires and self gratification what does that mean the sign of a person dead heart you notice i've shaded it red that's the no go zone red zone you know when you have a traffic lights is red what does that mean stop yes that's the zone here no go zone the dead heart what is it it's lifeless there's no life in it how is that it's pursuits of desires and self gratification it's all about satisfying your needs satisfying yourselves satisfying oneself and that's what capitalism has done capitalism has destroyed humans is destroyed mankind how is because capitalism is not just about satisfying people's needs but it's more about satisfying people's wants and desires yes you can survive on a little but think you know what people want more people want more and more and more and more so therefore you have to satisfy the cravings you know satisfying the craving that's self gratification you're trying to satisfy your nafs more and more but yet what did the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say in the hadith is that if a bani adam if the son of adam if he was if he was blessed with if he was given a mountain worth of gold he will desire for a second if he has two he will desire for a third if he has third he'll desire for a fourth and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said walam yamla ufahu illa fahu illa turab nothing shall fill his mouth except dust in other words when he's in the grave so this greed self gratification well devoid of the remembrance of allah shirk refusal of the truth that's what you call a dead heart what's the end result heart is sealed khatam allah ala qul khatam allah ala qulubihim allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees the heart is because this is what the heart is this is the red zone this is the dead this is the dead end this is a no go zone this is what you call when you call a dead heart the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in a hadith mathal alladhi yazkur rabbahu wal ladhi la yazkur rabbahu ka mathal al hayy wal mayyit the example of a person who remembers allah and the person who does not remember allah is like the example of a living and a dead so a, de- a person who does not remember allah at all his examples like that of a dead dead heart some scholars have said what this means some scholars have said that a person who doesn't remember allah his heart becomes dead so as a result of which the heart is sealed they're not willing to accept the truth you try to explain to them 10 times they're not willing to accept the reality they're not willing to accept the truth you tell them by islam go through one ear out the other and for god forbid for many of these people they don't even have the tawfiq to even pray salah and let, and let alone they don't even come to the masjid this is yeah and then effects of sins 
Ibn Qayyim Jawziya rahimahullah mentions, what does sin do? Deprives a person from knowledge, withdrawal of blessings from Allah, loneliness is a big problem. People go into isolation. People go to isolation. Somebody is going through problems. People go into distress. They lock themselves in the bedroom. Loneliness, alienation. They feel alienated. They feel that they don't belong in the community anymore. In fact, other people sometimes then push them out, which is why that when you've got somebody in that particular condition, they require help and affect others uh, around you. In other words, that when you're involved in sin, then not only does it have an impact on your life, but it also has an impact on your surroundings. There was one particular scholar, he mentions, is that if my family member, if they're behaving bad to me, or if my own camel is behaving bad to me, it's as a result of the bad so anxiety, weakness, uh, weakens the determination of the heart. So they lose self-confidence. They begin to lose self-confidence. So what's the solution to this? And I'm sorry, I have to uh, go through this quickly and I have to finish now. So what's the solution to this? Is basically this. The solution to your internal problems is you have to do righteous deeds. Seek Islamic knowledge. Reading Islamic books and attending Islam. Basically, this is what you need to do. Education. We need to educate ourselves and furthermore do righteous deeds. Imam Ghazali, you know, he was one of the great intellectuals of his time. And then when he, when he retreated to 10 years or 11 years of spiritual retreat, he came to this conclusion and said, sound knowledge is that which is practiced upon and leads you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any kind of knowledge that does not lead you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's not practical, that is not sound knowledge. So Islamic knowledge, what is that Islamic knowledge? Is teach us to practice our deen, take us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And staying in the company of the right people. And these are just things, I'll have to skip this. And the end result is struggle and knowledge, awareness of the worldly reality, inner strength, righteousness and wisdom. Jazakumullah khair. Wa akhru alhamdulillah.